the thought is to uh, to talk a little bit about my new book, Your 168. And uh, just to put in context uh, for some of you that that, uh, that I don't know, um, I always loved being part of the FEI. And then uh, I eventually became the, the chairman and CEO of uh, Baxter International, Baxter Healthcare, and uh, had the opportunity a number of years ago to come back to Kellogg, to Northwestern, where I went to school. I always say it was a few years ago. And my wife, Julie, says, no, it was 40 years ago. And I say, Julie, it was 40 years ago for you. We were there together. That, that usually ends, ends that discussion. So uh, I had always been at, uh, at Kellogg to pay my way through. I'd been a math major. So the way I paid my way through Kellogg is I, I graded all the finance papers for uh, the finance faculty. That was my job on, on the campus when I was a student. And the fellow who was the head of the finance department was this fellow by the name of Don Jacobs that some of you know who ended up becoming the, uh, the chairman, or excuse me, the dean of the school, and he was a dean for 26 years, a phenomenal guy. Um, and when I was leaving Baxter, um, I guess it was now 13 years ago, he called me and he said, Harry, I'm thrilled you're leaving, thank goodness, because I, I really want you to teach. And I said, you don't mean like have a syllabus, grade paper, that's not happening, I, I run companies. And he said, I think you said you do whatever I asked you to do. So here I am, so I, I've been at Kellogg now. He thought I was gonna teach finance because of my finance background and being a CPA and a CFO, and I said, hey, I've got an MBA. Kellogg's got all these brilliant PhDs. Uh, you know, there's no way I'm going to compete with these folks. And he said, well, what do you want to do? And I said, you know, I, uh, I'd really like to focus on leadership value and ethics. I, I would like to have a small impact uh, on the next generation of, of leaders. And as all of you know, one thing we desperately need on a global basis uh, is more value-based leaders, whether it's business, government, uh, academia, spiritual, you name it. And, uh, you know, Dean Jacobs said, that's fine, but you start in two weeks, so you, so you better get started. So I spent a couple of weeks reading all the articles I, I supposed to have read uh, when I was a student, and I, I've been teaching uh, leadership now uh, for all these years, which has just been fantastic. And any of you that have done any teaching know that, uh, at least in my case, uh, until I can, uh, unless I can actually put things in a way that is simple enough that people understand. I may think I understand it, but but not really. So it's when you teach that's when you, when, when you really learn. So uh, on my on my journey of teaching, the, the first thing that happened was I started teaching a class on, on value-based leadership. And the, the whole focus of my first book was, well, how, how do you become a value-based leader? What does that really mean? Um, and the real importance of realizing you can't lead other people until you can lead yourself. And I, I've gotten all my ideas from the students because after three or four years, the students started saying, okay, well, okay, that's how you become a value-based leader, following the four principles and so on. But how do you, how do you lead a value-based organization? And I think I may have talked about that in one of the seminars that I did for, for you folks a number of years ago. So I thought, okay, well, you know, I, I'm done. I got the two books. I'm teaching all these classes. It's, it's just been a lot of fun. And last year, uh, a couple of the students started saying, well, hey, okay, that's how you're a value-based leader. Uh, that's how you run a value-based organization, but, but here, here's one that we'd love to spend time on, which is how do you live a value-based life? How do you live a value-based life? Uh, and, and all of us on this webinar, you know, we all work hard, we all got a lot to do, um, but how do, you, how do you take all the things you wanna do in your life and, and, and really, really make it happen? And uh, that basically led to what is now the third book, which is called Your 168. And the first question almost always comes up now, as financial folks, I'm sure most of you do know this, but when I mention this to other, particularly non-financial folks, the first question is, well, what's 168? I mean, what, what is, what's that? I say, well, that's, the, that's in my mind the world's most important number, and people try to guess, and when they can't guess, uh, one CEO the other day said, I, I, I give up. I said, when you're having a bad week, and I mean having a really bad week, and you can't get everything done, how hard are you working? And he said, well, I'm, I'm working 24-7. I said, all right, now go slow. I was a math major. Multiply 24 times seven, carry the two, you usually get 168, okay? So most people on this call have 168 hours in, in a week. That, that's what you got, that's what you got. Um, and what's interesting is often if you'll talk to somebody and I'll say, hey Dan, uh, you know, would you like to do this with me? And, you know, Dan may say, well Harry, I, I, I'd love to, but, but I just don't have the time. And then I gotta remind Dan, you got the time, you, you got 168 hours. Now, it may not be high enough priority for you, but, but that's what you got, that's what you got. You got 168 hours. And as most of the folks on this call, uh, working as hard as you do, you may forget or you may not realize that virtually everybody on this call probably, I'm guessing, has at least two or three times the number of things you'd like to do than you're ever gonna get done. Now, I don't mean to disappoint you uh, on a Thursday afternoon, um, but when you think about 
your career, uh, maybe your family, maybe your spirituality, your health, a little bit of fun. Uh, maybe some folks realize we're here for a blink of an eye. You feel a moral obligation to make a difference in the world. Well, I, I know what I've got to do. I, I will just go faster and faster, okay? Uh, that's, where, that's where the uh, multitasking comes in, right? And since most of us have one of these little things here, you know, the great lie with, you know, blackberries, blueberries, iPhones, iPads, whatever, is, well, I'll just go faster and faster. And the question that I ask folks, and I do this with executives, CFOs, CEOs all the time, and it's, it's a question that, you know, maybe it'd be worthwhile to slow down and ask yourself, is have we confused activity and productivity? I mean, we're very active. We're remarkably active. But how productive are we? Or are we moving so fast, we have no idea how productive we are. That would take a lot of time we don't have. So let's, let's just keep moving. And I think the very first thing that a real value-based leader does is take the time to self-reflect. And when I say self-reflect, what that means for me is to take a short amount of time, right? Because you only got 168 hours. You get off by yourself. You know, you basically turn these gadgets off and, and ask yourself a couple of questions. And the types of questions I encourage value-based leaders to ask themselves are questions like the following. What are my values? What's my purpose? No kidding around what really matters. You know, this is not an advertising campaign. You know, this isn't an interview. No, you're by yourself, maybe significant other. Look in the mirror. What, what really matters? And I think by doing that, it really starts to put some of this stuff into perspective. Now, often folks will say, because I got this even with a, with a group this morning, they'll say, well, Harry, it sounds great. I mean, that, that, that sounds like it'd be wonderful, but the problem is I just don't have the time. And I always ask folks, is it that you don't have the time or is this something you really don't want to do? Because let's be honest, this, this could get a little sensitive pretty quickly, right? There could be a pretty big difference between what you say is important and what you really want to do. And eh, that, could be, that could be a little uneasy, right? Except that we're talking about leadership. Leaders are willing, willing to challenge themselves. Leaders are willing to get a little uncomfortable, right? And by the way, as I always mention to executives, when we say we don't have the time, it's sort of interesting because most people commute someplace, right? A lot of people try to exercise, and you can do this when you're taking a walk, uh, when you're, uh, you know, going for a jog, or maybe you're praying, meditating, whatever. Uh, so is it we don't have the time, or is it something that, uh, that we really don't want to do? And when we think about all the things we want to do, it usually leads to a discussion uh, of a very interesting term that I'm going to guess virtually everybody on this call uh, hears about in their organizations all the time. Uh, we talk about the fact that boy, what I really need to do to make all this happen uh, is I really need to have uh, something that's called work-life balance. Now, I don't know how much you've thought about this, but that even expression, maybe as a math uh, numbers kind of guy, always sort of concerns me because I think about it slowly, right? Work-life balance. Sounds to me like you're either working or you're living. And some of us are working enough. If that's not part of living, that could become a little bit of a problem. So uh, many years ago, uh, while I was at Baxter, I literally decided I'm going to stop talking about work-life balance. What I'm going to start talking about is life balance, right? Because interestingly enough, when I interviewed several hundred people and simply asked them, how are you trying to balance your life? Different people, different ages, different tenure, different countries. How are you going to balance? What does life balance mean to you? Interestingly enough, people talked about things in terms of buckets. You know, some would say, well, I have two or three important buckets. I got 10 buckets an amazing normal distribution around six buckets. And, and looking at these six buckets, which again, some people may not use all of them, but there were six buckets that people referred to over and over again, right? And in no particular order, it kind of went like this. Uh, there was a bucket for your career, your education. There's a bucket for your family and friends. There's a bucket for some people for their spirituality, whatever their religious perspectives are. There's a bucket for people's health. And in that bucket, throw in a little sleep occasionally, um, a little exercise. Uh, there's a fifth bucket for fun, enjoyment. And there's a sixth bucket, uh, which some people refer to as making a difference in the world, uh, doing something uh, that some people call social responsibility. Uh, I, in the book, I end up calling it uh, really being a, a best citizen. You know, we're passing through this world. How do you make a difference while, while, you're, while you're passing through? And the whole idea in my mind is thinking about, thinking about what's my ability to figure out how to create some kind of life balance for me. How do I think about my 168? Now, one comment that can, comes up a lot is, I'm not talking about every week, obviously, because some weeks, if you're, if you're traveling to Asia for the week, 
uh, or you've got a sick relative or, or a child, you know, that week's going to be obviously extraordinary. So I'm actually talking about on average, on average, what percent of your time do you spend where? And the exercise I have folks go through, and you'll see this in the book, but I'll tell you this much, do not, do not attempt this exercise I'm going to mention now unless you're in a really good mood, really good mood. Here's the exercise. You take those six buckets, right? And the first column is the goal, the goal. I mean, if, if you could line it up in a way consistent with your values and what's important in your life, how would you think about how much time you'd allocate to career, family, spirituality, health, having a good time, making a difference in the world? So the first one is the goal, okay? The second column is current reality, okay? That's, you look at your calendar, not one week, but you look at, you know, the weeks of the last four or five months, and on average, where did you spend your time? Now, the third column is the difference, right? I have yet to meet the person, maybe it's Susan or Dan, I don't know, when you say, wow, there's an amazing coincidence. My goal lines up with exactly where I'm spending my time. I, I, you don't meet many of those people. Usually there's a difference. Now, if it's a small difference, welcome to the real world because none of us are always going to be, you know, life balance in my mind is more the pursuit of rather than actually accomplishing it. But if you're way off, are you way off because, well, I said that was important, but it wasn't really that important or, oh, no, it's really important. But I've not been disciplined enough to really spend the time where I said I was going to spend the time. And I think taking a little bit of time to really think that through and understand it is a habit. Now, one other, you'd say this is obvious, but I'll mention it anyway. Those six buckets, when you figure out and you look at the percentage of your goal, the sum of that, the sum of those cannot exceed 100%. Okay? Now, some would say, well, that's pretty obvious. Well, I don't know about you, but when I was uh, – a pretty young financial guy, I literally had a boss who said to me, Harry, I'm going to need 110% from you. And I, I remember trying to explain to this guy, I'm going to work harder than most people, but there's no, there's only 100%. How do you have more than 100% of a pie? That, that, that's what you got, okay? It didn't go well, but, you know, I, I survived. That guy didn't, so I, I guess it worked okay. So you basically have 168 hours, and literally thinking through where you're going to spend that time, I, I think becomes very, very important, right? Now, when you think about that, and I, I talk about this uh, in, in, the, in, the book, in the first couple of chapters of the book. If, if self-reflection helps you figure that out, and oh, by the way, anytime I talk about balance, the reason why I always start with self-reflection is think about the number of people you know, if you're honest. This could be yourself. This could be your significant other. This could be you know, your, the folks on your team. Think of how often somebody will say, I get this a lot, they'll say, well, um, Harry, I, uh, I'm having a hard time putting things in balance. I'm, I'm having trouble achieving balance. My observation is the majority of people that are having trouble keeping things in balance, the majority of people haven't been reflective enough to figure out what they're trying to balance, right? If you haven't figured out what you're trying to balance, okay, how could you possibly balance it, right? So thinking that through, I think, becomes very important, okay? But let's say, let's pretend you thought it through, right? We're on that journey. Well, how, how do you stay close enough to it and, and what happens when you, you fall off the curve, which, we, which we're all going to do. And some of you that have worked with me in the past know I, I try to come up with these simple analogies uh, that help put this in perspective. So here's the crazy analogy I, I've been using lately. Uh, let's assume a bunch of us are in Chicago now today, and uh, we're, we're driving to New York. Okay. Now, anybody that's done that, I'm pretty sure, I think it's Route 80, that most of the way is, is, uh, is the one path to get there. Now, if, if, if life was perfect and I was in complete life balance, I start off in Chicago, I'm on Route 80, I'm there, and I never get off. Now, the reason I like that analogy is that's just not the real world, right? Because if Dan and Susan and I are driving from Chicago to New York, we're going to get off at exit ramps. Instead of going straight there, we're off exit ramps once in a while, right? Uh, we're, we're, uh, we're staying in the hotel, we're having dinner, we got to get gas, somebody's got to go to the restroom. And the reason that works for me is, you know, there's going to be times we're getting off. But the key thing is, do we know we're getting off, all right? And do we know how far off we are from, from what our goal is? So the example I would throw out is, um, I, I have five children, and if uh, my youngest daughter says, hey, Dad, uh, you know, could we go for a bike ride? And I think to myself, well, no, I, I've got to get, uh, I gotta get on, a, on a call with the FEI group. I, I, I can't do it. I'm well aware my daughter asked me to go for a bike ride, and for a very legitimate reason, I can't do it. But I'm remembering that. So tomorrow when she says, hey, can we go for a bike ride? And I'm thinking about reading a book. I'm thinking, you know what? No, I'll read the book later. That's really important to me. So I, I get back on. I, I know I'm going to be kind of like 
you know, cycling through this, but I'm staying pretty close. Well, what happens to many people that you've seen that literally uh, go, off, go off the wagon here, okay? Uh, and I, I often, I think, um, in the book call it, hit the wall. Well, here's what happens. Um, again, Dan and Susan and I are driving from Chicago to New York, all right? Uh, Dan and I are asleep in the back seat, and Susan wakes us up and says, hey, I think we have a problem. Oh, Susan, you know, what's the problem? Well, there, here's a sign right ahead of us here. Take a look out the window. The sign says, entering Atlanta. Okay, now, I don't know how many of you have driven from Chicago to New York, but if there's a sign that says entering Atlanta, we're off course. And, and, it, and the work segment of that would be the people we've seen that, you know, they've gained 40 pounds, all right? They, they've got serious marital issues. Uh, they've got a heart attack. I mean, literally, they've hit the wall. And I talk a lot about what do you do to avoid doing that? And if you do do it, what do you do to come back on? And that, in my mind, is all about building habits. Because this whole idea of making sure that you're true to yourself uh, really comes down to a set of habits. I actually put it into usually four words. I mentioned to the students at Kellogg. If I'm really, really going to be successful with this, I think four things have to happen. All right? I have to be disciplined. I have to stay focused. I have to do it consistently. And then I start to establish a little credibility with myself. And then I have a credibility with other people. Right? So discipline, focus, consistency, building credibility, and making sure that really happens. So well, let's, let's use a couple of, uh, of concrete examples um, that, 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 that may be helpful. Uh, I run into people that'll say, you know, um, boy, when I look at my time and I look at my work schedule or whatever, uh, I realize um, I really need to exercise. I really, really need to start to exercise. All right, well, then you see the person a month later, and they'll say, well, hey, Joe, how's it going? Well, uh, I haven't had a chance to exercise, but, but Harry, I think you'll understand. Well, hey, it's your 160. Your 168 is different than mine, so if exercise isn't important for you, you know, that, that's your own trade-off. I'm not making a value trade. No, no, Harry, no, Harry, I really want to, but you have to understand, uh, I, I, I just can't. I said, why? Well, uh, Harry, my job, I, I'm traveling 60% of the time, uh, and by the time I get to a hotel at night, uh, after nine o'clock, the gym's closed, the fitness center's closed. I, so, Harry, you understand my point. And I said, well, uh, I'll give you an opinion. I don't have any answer. I have an opinion, but, you know, I travel at least 60% of the time. Um, and when I'm traveling 60% of the time, uh, what I realize is what I try to do, I, my, my rule is I don't stay at a hotel that doesn't have a 24-hour gym, okay? Uh, because by the time I get to the hotel, it's closed. Well, guess what? I either stay in a hotel with 24 hours or I've worked it out ahead of time uh, with the, the uh, hotel clerk that lets me in. Um, so this whole idea of making sure you're doing uh, what, you, what you say you're going to do. Uh, Susan, I just want to make sure that uh, we're online okay and it's still working. We Please are. Go. You're doing great. We're okay. all very interested in everything you have to say. Okay, well, I, I just want to make sure that, uh, as you know, with these videos, uh, sometimes you're, you're talking and it, uh, the, the, uh, the thing doesn't, isn't working right. So I, I hope I it is. I get it. You're good, Harry. Okay, and I, and I, hope, I hope, Susan, uh, I'll keep going another five or ten minutes, but I hope that you get a lot of questions because I, I'd really rather uh, get into some of this and focus on the pieces that would be most helpful. So the more, the more questions we get, uh, that, would be, uh, that, that would be real helpful. The other thing... Um, Harry, I'm just going to say to my attendees really quick, Here's your opportunity to have one-on-one -on -one question with Harry Kramer. So take advantage of it. Okay, Harry, back to you. Well, the, the more, and, I, and I always say, Susan, as you know, uh, the, and again, keep jumping in, Susan. I always keep saying that I have very, very few answers, but like everybody on this call, I have many opinions. Uh, so I don't do q and I do Q&O, and, and the more the better. So um, that, that, that always works great. So the, uh, the other example I'll give you, and this may surprise you uh, as financial people, uh, but it's interesting to me that I will run into CFOs all the time that they will say to me, you know, I, I'm, I'm having a lot of trouble balancing something. And I'll say, well, what's the story? And here's the example that I'll give you. I had one very senior fellow come up to me and he said, Harry, I, I really need to talk to you. I really need to talk to you. And I said, well, what, what's, what's the situation? And he said, well, I've got, uh, I've got marital issues. I've got problems with my three children. That's really important to me to fix I'd love to talk to you. And I, my comment was, well, geez, I'll call the guy George. George, um, you know, I, have, I don't have any answers. No, but you have five children, and you talk about this one. I'd, I'd really love to talk to you. And I said, okay, well, George, I'll tell you what. Tomorrow is Saturday. Uh, you want to stop over the house, and uh, we can chat about this for a while. 
And he said, well, Harry, I, I can't do it Saturday. I, I, I'm golfing on set. And I said, okay, well, um, oh, I'll tell you what, George. Uh, on Sunday, hey, after church, do you want to stop by? Well, no, I, I can't do it on Sunday because um, I'm golfing on Sunday. Now, here's how open I am about this. If, if golf is more important to this guy, and that's what, how he wants to live his life, I'm not going to judge that. But, but he just said how important his family was. And again, as the old numbers guy, uh, if I think it takes five hours to golf and you do, do that twice, that's 10 hours, okay? So when you say you don't have the time, you got the time. In fact, there's 10 hours. But as I mentioned, I, there's a lot of people, they don't even realize where they're spending their time. And so at least in my mind, one of the enormous benefits of this self-reflection, taking a little bit of time, and I could, again, I could give you examples of, of, of specifically what I try to do on this self-reflection. By taking a little bit of time, one of the enormous advantages of this that some people don't realize is taking a little bit of time to be self-reflective. It literally minimizes the surprise. In fact, here's something you can actually think about. Anybody on this call can determine whether somebody else is self-reflective by talking to them for about 15 minutes. People say, well, how could that be? Well, it turns out people that are not self-reflective are constantly surprised and you're surprised they're surprised. Right? The example I use in class a lot is uh, I'm out at O'Hare Airport. Uh, I run into a former student. Oh, uh, I said, hey, you know, uh, hey, Phil, how are you doing? Well, Professor Kramer, no, Harry. Well, Harry, I I'm just a little surprised right now. Oh, Phil, what are you surprised by? Well, I have, a, um, I have two young boys now. I have no relationship with my two sons. I, I have no relationship at all. I said, well, Phil, do you spend time with your, your two sons? Well, no, I don't spend any time with them at all. Oh, okay, then I think to myself, he's surprised. I'm surprised you're surprised. In fact, anybody can try that because the next time somebody asks, somebody uh, you talk to and they say they're surprised, you should just ask them why they're surprised. And you're not going to want to say this to them, but you're going to wonder why are you surprised? Because it turns out if you're self-reflective, you're not that surprised often because you don't know when it's going to happen, but it's going to happen. And what I mean by that is it turns out that most of us on this call at one time or another didn't get the job we wanted or didn't get the promotion that we wanted, or you know, somebody we love and care deeply about passes away and dies. It's very unfortunate, it's very unfortunate, but it shouldn't be a surprise. And so this ability to put things into perspective, this ability to make sure that the words go along with the music, I think becomes very, very important, very, very important. So when I take a look then, and then when I literally go through, and I go through examples of each one of these bricks or each one of these buckets and ask myself, okay, am I doing at least what I said I'm going to do? So I'll talk about a couple of them briefly and then we're going to open this up for uh, as many questions as, uh, as you guys would like to talk about. And when I think about this, each one of these is important to a certain degree for some people. But, you know, you think about your career. Well, the career is very, very important, but obviously if you're not careful, it turns out that you may be spending all of your time in your career and not even realize you're spending all, all your time in your career. So the whole concept of, am I really doing what I said I'm going to do? And when people say, well, boy, I don't, I don't think there's any way that I, I can prevent that. Um, that's just sort of the way things are. I realize how often do we realize, are we doing things as efficiently as we can? And again, as financial people, Maybe we, we're, we're more used to thinking this way, but very often when I visit companies, I realize many people in a company could actually, re, re, if they thought about what they were doing, they could reduce the amount of time it takes by 20, 25%. And somebody says, well, how could that be? Well, it turns out that in a lot of companies, people are doing things that they really don't need to do, or they're doing them more often because that's the way they do them. So a good financial example, I had one executive call me and say, Harry, we just can't get everything done. We keep talking about this one thing. We just can't do it. And I'll say, well, hey, how about I stop by? We can just chat about it. So one fellow I went into, actually was a financial guy, and I said, hey, could I talk to you for 10, 15 minutes? He said, well, I can't talk to you right now. I just don't have the time. I said, all right, well, just real quickly, what are you doing right now? And the guy said, well, I'm doing a forecast. I'm doing a forecast. I don't have the time to talk. I said, well, how often do you do the forecast? He said, I do it every week. Every week I do that forecast. Well, is it, is it a good process? Well, no, I, ju I just don't have the time. So, well, here's just a crazy idea. Well, what if you did the forecast once a month and really took the time to do it? 
Well, no, I do it every week. No, no, I know you do it every week now, but what if you actually took the time, Harry, we do it every week. That's just the way we do it. And I realized the number of organizations that do things a certain way without really wondering, is this really the best way to do it? So this whole idea of how much time you've got and are you being as efficient as, as, as you could possibly be. In terms of the second bucket around family, friends, community, um, I think you just have to ask yourself, is this important to me or not? Because what is interesting here is people will think, oh, well, you know, hey, the children are real young. Uh, I'll spend a lot more time with them when they get older. And then all of a sudden they're surprised because, you know, they're 18 and they're off to college and, oh, geez, I, I, it just happens so fast. Well, no, it doesn't happen that fast. It happens faster if you're not paying attention to, to what you're doing. And finding ways, by the way, to blend these things together. And are you really as focused on these things as you say? And this one gets a little emotional because some folks will say, oh, no, I'm involved and I'm, I'm going to my children's sporting events. And where I really got a good sense of how you have to be careful with this whole multitasking, I, I tried to coach one team for each of my children. And when I was coaching a second grade girls soccer team many years ago, um, I remember the one little girl uh, got, hit a goal. And I said, isn't this great? You know, your dad and mom are there. And she looked, this is a six-year-old, and she looked at me and said, well, they're, they're, they're there, uh, Mr. Kramer, but they're just on their, their, their iPhones. You know, they're, they're not really, they not, haven't really watched me for the last half hour. And I'm thinking to myself, a six-year-old can figure that out. You know, are, are we naive enough not to realize, are we really focusing and doing what we say we're going to do? You know, the health piece I already talked about, you know, that's either important or it's not important. And... As everyone on this call knows, you know, you guys, when I say guys, men or women, you're, you're, not, you're not in a sprint here. Uh, you're, you're on a marathon. And taking care of yourself becomes really, really critical. Uh, the whole focus of this, which I think becomes really, really important, is if you think about it, and the example I, I think of a lot is when we were in sports, right? When we were all younger uh, and we were involved in a lot of sports, you know, what, what did the coach say? The coach usually said, hey, eat right get some sleep, get some rest, take care of yourself. And then you look at what a lot of us are doing, right? Where we're running around, we're not getting enough sleep, maybe we're not eating what we ought to eat, um, and realizing this is not a sprint. For many of us, this literally is gonna be a 40, 50 year marathon. So pacing yourself as part of this 168, I think becomes very, very important. Now, uh, for some of us, uh, the spiritual element becomes important. Uh, you know, how do we think about our life and life beyond here and so on? And if that's important, you know, are you dedicating some time to that? Uh, and at Kellogg, we to talk about it in terms of, are you completely focused on success? Or is it thinking about significance? Is it literally your resume? Or is it your legacy? Okay, and, and what, what, you, what you leave behind for, uh, for your children and, and your grandchildren. And so thinking about that. And of course, the fun one becomes very important. And some people say, well, I'll, I'll make sure I have some fun when I get all the work done. Well, you know what? How do you, how do you make sure that you actually build that in? And, and are there ways that you can combine some of these things? I, I remember when I was the CFO, like many of you, you know, you get asked by bankers or whatever, hey, do you want to go to a Cubs game or whatever? And anytime I would get asked about something like that, I'd always say, well, hey, I'll tell you what. Uh, if, if you've got a couple of children and you want to bring them, I'll bring a couple of my children, but I'm not spending a night a, a, away from the children to go to a game when, you know, I'm away enough as it is. Um, so finding ways uh, to have fun and do it in a way where you're including people that are important to you, whether it's a significant other or your children, I, I think become very, very important. And then the, the last one, which I happen to believe is, is pretty important is most of us on this call are pretty fortunate. I mean, if you think about this whole COVID situation right now, like many of you, I'm sure I get asked almost every day, well, how are you doing, Harry? How are you doing? And to make this real simple, I decided there was an easy way for me to respond to that, which is what I've been doing lately, which is I think as of the last day or two now, there's a million people around the world that have died, right? And if you think about each one of those people having, you know, 100 people that are close to them, relatives, family, friends, this has significantly impacted over 100 million people, right? In the United States, we've crossed now 200,000 people have died of COVID. And I believe the last number, there's 35 million Americans uh, that, that are unemployed, all right? So when people say, how am I doing? I I'm doing actually fairly well, okay? Uh, I, the only issues I have is how do I help other people that are a lot less fortunate than I am, okay? Uh, the people that literally are having a hard time, hard, hard time making it. 
And I think taking the time to think about those people and then realizing, all right, what are my problems? Well, if my biggest problem is I can't go to the movies or I can't go to the fitness center right now, um, you know, that's sort of first world problems. Um, how, how do I really think about helping others? And so thinking about that whole 168, what am I going to do? What am I not going to do? Um, and thinking about how close to what my goal is for my life is, is, is what I'm actually living. And uh, that's sort of the whole focus of, of what, uh, what ended up becoming uh, this third book, Year 168, Finding Purpose and Satisfaction uh, in, in a Value-Based Life. So, uh, Susan, what I could do is I could uh, entertain you guys for like the next three or four hours and pretend it's one of my Kellogg classes, but this is a busy group of people, and uh, I'd love to take any questions really uh, related to either things I've already talked about uh, or uh, other things related to the book or, you know, more than happy to talk about uh, uh, the op opinions related to, to COVID and what we're going through um, that, would, that would be helpful. Sounds great, Harry. So we do have a couple of questions. Um, the first one is uh, uh, Dave Burke, who's our president here, said he missed the third column of your exercise. Could you repeat that? Sure. Okay. I'll, I'll, I'll try to do them in order. The, the, the first one is your career, your education. The second one is your family. The third one is your spirituality, whatever your religious obligations are. Your fourth one is your health, including sleep and exercise. The fifth one is fun, enjoyment, you know, having a good time, going to the ball game or whatever. And the sixth one uh, I call being a best citizen, but being socially responsible, both as an individual and an organization. Thank you. Um, next, we have a question from Mark, and Mark says, although it is less um, of an issue these days as it was 20 years ago, how would you coach someone who has, uh, who's faced with the relocation of their job for a nice promotion, but that would put a strain on their family? Yeah, Mark, gr great question, and, and that's one of the reasons why I'm always serious when I say opinions uh, uh, rather than answers. So here is, for me, everything is a balance uh, and I often, Mark, talk about four principles that become important, right? Self-reflection, balance, having true self-confidence and genuine humility. And, and I think this, this one is a, is a balanced one that, that somebody has to really think through. And you have to almost sit down, you know, maybe with your significant other, with your children and say, all right, now here, here's a trade-off. I've got an opportunity now for a, uh, for a significant promotion, uh, which will give us, you know, financial uh, gains and so on. Now, is it worth that to us? Is how do I, how do I how do I compare the impact financially and a career move versus what the impact of that could be on my family, my immediate family, relatives, or whatever? Um, and and literally thinking that through. And and to the extent that you know you uh, you do have a significant other, uh, is this something? And it's a two career family. Is this something that the two of you have talked about? that you really truly want to make happen as a family. I mean, I'll tell you, Mark, in my career at Baxter, uh, sometimes I would be offered a, uh, a promotion uh, and I would sit down with Julie, who went to Kellogg with me and worked at Citibank for 15 years. And I'd say, hey, here's the deal. Uh, Baxter's offering me a promotion to go to California. Uh, we're only going to do this if this is something that you actually also think makes sense. And one time she said, you know what? Um, let me talk to the folks. And if there's a position, great. And another time, it wasn't something that worked for her, and then we didn't do it. So I think, again, Mark, that idea of being self-reflective, I repeat it again. What are my values? What's my purpose? What matters? And then literally seeing what does that trade-off look like uh, and making the best informed decision you can make in an uncertain world. Thank you, Harry. Then we have a question from Janine. She said she wants to understand more about the self-reflection process, and is there a best practice to get this done? Yeah, sure. So I'll, uh, uh, I'll, give, you, I'll give you a good example. Um, and, and by the way, all the questions uh, that I use in these uh, self-reflection, uh, they're not only in the book, but my students at Kellogg, uh, I should have said this up front, uh, Susan, they actually set up a website for me. Um, that it's just harrykramer.org, uh, and in the, it goes through in the blog post a lot related to self-reflection. You, you can follow if you'd like. But, but here's the thought process, and this is good because I, you brought this up. I'll, I'll go into a little detail for you. It turns out that when I say self-reflection, for me, that really means, as I said, taking a little bit of time to think about this. So the habit that I have is 
I'm not a morning person. Maybe it's five kids, uh, a lot of uh, teaching I'm on 10 boards. Um, for me, it's late at night. And for me, it's usually midnight. And I do it every night. Uh, and I go through what I've referred to as a, a self-examination at the end of every night. Mine goes a little bit like this. What did I say I was going to do today? What did I actually do? What am I proud of? What am I not proud of? How did I lead people? How did I follow people? If I lived today over again, what would I have done differently? And then the last one is, if I have tomorrow, being fully well aware that sooner or later I won't, but if I do have tomorrow, based on what I learned today, how will I operate differently tomorrow on whatever dimension of your life has any significance? It could be uh, as, as a spouse, as a parent, as a leader, uh, as an employee, whatever, whatever really matters to you. Um, and folks will say to me, well, do you do this every day? I, I do this every day. I've done this every day now for almost 40 years. I, I started this when I was at, at Kellogg. Uh, and the way I give an example, if I'm at a party with all of you until midnight, I'm going to guess most of you will probably brush your teeth before you go to bed because that's a habit you got into when you were two or three years old. So this is a habit for me. And then sometimes folks will say, well, do you have to write it down? I don't think you have to write it down. I write it down, Susan, because if I write, don't write it down, um, am I self-reflecting or am I just daydreaming, particularly if I've had a couple of glasses of wine? Okay, so it, it literally puts things in, into perspective. Now, that's what I do. Some people, you know, for all I know, some people on this call may have gotten up at 6 o'clock this morning and done meditation or taken a jog along the lake uh, or done it when they were commuting. I, I think there's a lot of ways to do this, but the key thing for me and my advice for people is to take a little bit of time to slow down to ask yourself, what am I doing and why am I doing it? Because as you know, Susan, it amazes me, as I said earlier, it amazes me how very bright people are surprised all of the time. I, I, I'll give you one more, Susan, that happened uh, that I was reflecting on again. But think about people you know. They get into their, uh, their early 40s. They do incredibly well. So they, they want to build this big, big house. You know, there's a lot of houses they could buy, but they want to build one. Uh, they say it'll take six months, but it takes three years. I mean, it is a, it's just an amazing exercise. But they finally get this enormous house built, and then you don't see the person. And then 10 years later, you run into them and say, hey, uh, hey, Bill, you know, how are things going? How's the house? Oh, Harry, you got all kinds of issues. What's the issue? Well, we're downsizing. We got, we got to get out there. Why? Well, all, all the children have gone to college. It's just, it's just Susan and I. And you say to yourself, did you not realize 10 years ago that all your children 10 years later would be 10 years older and they wouldn't be there. I mean, you're surprised. I'm, su I'm surprised you're surprised. So this whole idea of, of taking a little bit of time to minimize all this confusion that goes on. And uh, this self-reflection process is a, is, is a very, very big part of it. Harry, Grace wants to know, and it's along these same lines, are there people who do this right? Any suggestions or recommendations for spending better quality time with the family and getting the family to unplug and really connect? I think there are many, many different ways people do this. Um, I find it, uh, it comes back to those four words before, Grace, this discipline, focus, consistency, credibility. Um, and where I've seen it work pretty well uh, is that a family decides maybe over uh, a course, you know what? No matter how busy anybody is, guess what? We're going to spend, whether it's two nights, three nights, four nights, decide having dinner together. And literally, everybody's at the table. Uh, there's a moratorium, any devices being in the room. that they're, they're parked outside someplace. And we're actually going to take the time to talk. And then as soon as dinner's over, we're going to sit out on the outside patio, all of us regardless of age, and talk about what are we doing? What's our hopes? What's our aspirate? What are we thinking about? Because we've gotten to this point now where, you know, I'm sure you folks have seen it. Now, you haven't seen it the last five months because uh, people are, are not eating out at, inside restaurants. All. But I, I found it so amazing, Grace, that you'll go into a nice restaurant and there'll be a, a couple with their three children. All five of them are just looking at their devices. It's like, what are you doing? What are you doing? Um, and, I, and I think it's almost become like, like a disease, right? And people literally think, Oh, I'm being productive. You know, you guys, I'm sure in meetings where, oh, we'll take a break for 15 minutes. And in 15 minutes, you know, so, oh, I can get through 20 emails, 40 texts, you know, a couple of Snapchats, whatever the heck that is, right? I'm in motion. And I, and I think these things have literally become 
uh, almost a disease. You know, uh, and I've seen a lot of people basically say, you know what, this social media thing, I'm literally going to, I'm going to literally time myself that I'm not going to spend more than a half an hour a day uh, on this social media thing. Uh, and by the way, this breeds all kinds of problems uh, that we're all living through right now uh, as a society, which uh, we're all very aware of as to how, how is how is the country as polarized as it is now. Um, I actually think it's because of these devices, but more than happy to give opinions on that one. Harry, so Grace says, thank you. Um, Craig says, can you talk about how this self-reflection process can influence someone's decision about when or whether to retire? Oh, wow. This is perfect. Perfect. Okay. Who, whose question was this? That is Craig. And Craig's one of our new members. Oh, Craig. 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 Great question, Craig. Uh, and because I, because I just turned 65, I, I can really help you out on this one. Um, you know, for me personally, uh, we just celebrated, Julie and I just celebrated uh, our 40th wedding anniversary, which is a little hard to believe, Susan, since I'm only 39 years old. It's a little hard to believe, but it's one of those, right. Einstein, it's one of those Einstein relativity things. But uh, um, I mentioned that because I have a number of friends that are turning 65. Julie told me, and I'm sure you guys have heard that line, in which she said 40 years ago, you know, what is it? Uh, in sickness and health, for better or worse, but Harry, not for lunch. I mean, Harry, you being home for lunch would be incredibly inconvenient for me. Okay, so I, I already told the dean, Susan, my goal is to teach the next 15 years, God willing, at, at Kellogg. But, but here's, here's the issue, Craig, that you have to be careful about. And it, it's so great you raise it, Craig, because it goes right to this issue of self-reflection. So I'll give you two, two ways. If, if somebody, regardless of age, they may be 55, 60, 65, whatever it is, if they say to themselves, hey, you know what? I, uh, I, I think I'm going to retire from this full-time job. I, I, think, I think I may want to teach or I may want to work for Habitat for Humanity or do something at the lo or, or write the great American novel or whatever. Fantastic. But Craig, what happens, and you can warn your friends about this, the number of friends I've had who've said, Harry, I, I, I can't wait till I retire. I just want to retire. So what happens is they retire, and it usually goes like this, Craig. They're going 100 miles an hour. They're a CFO or a treasurer. They're going 100 miles an hour. They they're just can't wait till they retire. So they retire. The way it usually works, Craig, is they take a trip around the world for a month. They go all over the place. They come home. They golf, Craig, every day for two weeks. And then it's Monday, right? And so Monday, it's like, well, what am I going to do? And, you know, he says to, uh, to Mary, hey, Mary, you know what? Uh, you know, what are we going to do today? And Mary goes, I've gotten by just perfectly well without you around the last 35 years. You know, you being around is going to be a little inconvenient for me. And the person, Craig, is surprised. And what I can't figure out is, how can you go from 100 miles an hour to being retired without wondering, what am I going to do with all that time? And I think it's particularly sensitive now, Craig, because I've spent 40 years in healthcare, And some of you may be too young to realize this, but when they put in Medicare and Medicaid in 1965, Susan, the reason they chose the age of 65, and I'm being a, a little comical when I say this, but it's true. The reason they put it the age in at 65 is that in 1965, the average American lived till 65. So the way this was supposed to work, Susan, is you work till 65, you took a trip back to the homeland, right, which for some people may be Europe or whatever, you came home and you died. That's the way this was supposed to work. The whole reason we've got, you know, a $20 trillion deficit is that the average person on this call is going to live till 83, all right? Well, we got a lot of financial people on this call. If you got a system based on on living till 65 and you live till 83, you got a little bit of a disconnect. So the great news, the great news is we're blessed and hopefully many of us will live till your 80s. Well, guess what? If somebody at 55 decides they're gonna retire, there is a reasonable chance that you could be retired for longer than you worked. Right now, some people may get excited about that and say, well, that's fantastic because I have a whole list of all the things I'm going to do. Well, is the whole list, Craig, of all the things you want to do, is it really going to fill part of 168 or are you going to be surprised? I don't know if that helps, Craig, but this one now for me comes up almost every day. So here we've got a couple. First of all, Janine just wants to recommend to everybody. It's a documentary called Social Dilemma, and it's about device disease oh wow so I just yeah so I thought I would share that with everybody that's great Susan and, and if you could send me a copy of that Susan I'd, I'd love that I'd, I love that okay great 
Well, and then we have Wes, and, and Wes is, um, he was in our CFO of the Year Awards. He was one of our finalists. Oh, wow. Um, he says, thank you so much. This is uh, very inspiring. Uh, would recommend to engage a best friend or spouse to support the change. Self-reflection is key. However, how do you create feedback loops for us? Fantastic. So, Wes, uh, you guys are great, and this is great because when you guys jump in, it, it helps me uh, sort of give you the next step on a lot of these things. So, Wes, I didn't mention this earlier, and you're absolutely right. Everything I talked about related to this process of, of self-reflection, taking the time, asking yourself the questions, being disciplined, all of that, Wes, is the first part. The second part, which you're all over, is you got to find people that can hold you accountable because, let's be honest, most of us are, are very, very good at fooling ourselves. And my wife, Julie, will often say to me, uh, Harry, left to your own devices, you could convince yourself of a lot of things. Do you want to know what I think? Well, after 40 years, Susan, the answer to that better be yes, or I'm going to be in a lot of trouble, okay? The answer better, better, better be yes. And the example I would give, Wes, uh, is you got to have several people. I, I have somebody I went to college with, uh, two folks from Kellogg. Uh, I have a, one of my sisters, Julie, uh, as well. Uh, there's a priest that I'm very close to. I think you've got to have some people that, that really hold you to the fire on this one. And the, the example, Wes, I give you is if, uh, if you and I were working together, Wes, and I realized, boy, this Wes is a, is a very good guy. He's got good values. I, I'm going to take you to lunch, Wes. And when we're at lunch, I'm going to lay out for you some of the things that are really important to me because I want to get your read on this. And, and let's look at the range, Wes, of reaction that I could get from you. In fact, I'll give it to you from good news to bad news, right? The good news is I start to explain this and you say, hey, Harry, stop for a minute. You know what? I've been working with you for five years. Based on your actions, I could have guessed what your values are. You're, you're like this. You're just, you're lined up perfectly, okay? Now, the other side, Wes, the other side of the real world, uh, not so happy is when you stop me and say, hey, Harry, wait, wait a second. Ba based on your actions, I'm amazed you think that those are your values. I mean, Harry, you're like Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. So finding people, as you're saying, Wes, that literally can make sure that you're not fooling yourself uh, and that you really are who you say you are, I think becomes incredibly important. So I start off with myself and very rapidly, I got to find some people to, to, uh, that'll help me hold accountable. We have a question from Doug. He said, pressures in life may squeeze time allocated to being a best citizen. Any thoughts on how to give this bucket additional attention? Yeah, wow. Uh, this one's, it was Doug, you said? Doug. Yeah, so Doug, again, thank you guys so much, uh, the men and women, for, for, for the questions here. Uh, and this is, this is a really good one. And the way I think about this one is, is this, and you guys can tell me what you think about it. You got 168. I think as early as possible, even for some of the younger folks that are on this call, I think you pretty early on wanted to decide what's important. And if you decide, Doug, if you decide, you know what, I am blessed, I am fortunate, um, I, I do have a moral obligation to help others, I think you have to build it in really early because as you well know, Doug, as you get older, you get more and more, it's not like there's going to be free time later, right? You'll, you'll see younger people will say, oh, well, in the future, I'm going to want to do more of that. Well, the reality of it is you're getting to a bigger job and another bigger job, more and more responsibility, maybe more children, elderly parents. So if it's important, you got to find the time early on. And uh, I'll, I'll give you, Doug, this sort of goes to, to one that hadn't come up yet. But again, this is where I, I kind of challenge folks is when I say really thinking through this 168, I think you really have to ask yourself, where am I spending the time? And when uh, so one fellow said to me, well, Harry, I'd really like you to tell me maybe any of your opinions because I really truly would like to get more involved uh, with a nonprofit. I'd really like to spend more time uh, with, with my church uh, or, or my, uh, my temple, but I, I, just, I just don't have the time. And I'll say, okay, well, I'll, I'll be honest with you. I said, here's what happened to me. Um, I early on tried to figure this out. And Julie was the one who came up with it. She said, hey, we keep talking, Harry, about 168. This was many years ago. And she said, Harry, where do we spend time that it's not very efficient? We don't get a lot out of it. We say we're going to do it for an hour, and then suddenly four hours have gone by. And I don't know how it works in your relationships, but often she plays this guessing game rather than just telling me. I said, all right, Julie, I, I give up. What, what do you think? She said, television. She said, you know, we say we're going to watch it for an hour. It's on for three or four hours. We don't get much out of it, and it's certainly not good for the children. 
So believe it or not, Doug, we decided, I think it was 30 years ago, that we were going to stop watching television. So we have not watched television for 35 years. Now, when it first started, I was a, a little uh, a skeptical because I said, Julie, I, I need to know the news. I mean, it's really important for me to know the news. And she said, Harry, wait a second. You read the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, the Financial Times, The Economist every day. Harry, Harry, the only thing you miss by not watching the news is, you know, Jojo the giraffe escaped from the zoo. I mean, you know, so it's been 30 some years. And of course, Doug, where I always try to have a little sense of humor with people, I get students that will say to me, this comes up a lot. They'll say, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. If you don't watch any television, what about sports? What about sports? And I'll tease them. Rather than answering, I answer Doug with a question, which is, are you going to exercise? Or are you going to watch other people exercise? And if you're going to watch other people exercise, there's nothing wrong with that. It's your 168. But are you going to watch other people exercise two hours uh, a week, four hours a week? Uh, I've got relatives that watch other people exercise 20 hours a week. I mean, it's all day Saturday and Sunday. Now, if they're happy and that's what they want to do and realizing they've only got another 148, if that's what they want to do, that's fine. I'm not going to judge that. Uh, but I had one friend who said, well, uh, Harry, I'm not happy. I'm just not happy. I said, why not? He said, I'll tell you why, Harry. That guy's batting 210. They're paying him $35 million a year, Susan. I do not understand how they're paying that guy $35 million a year. Well, I'll help you. The only way they can pay that guy $35 million a year is you're watching him. You know, you're drinking Miller Lite and eating ladies' potato chips. By the way, you can only get away with that if, if you're a pretty good friend, right? Or, uh, so, so this whole idea, Doug, in my mind is, is it important or isn't it? Okay? And if it's important, you, you better build it in early because it's not going to get easier as, as, you, uh, as you get older. That's my opinion. Thanks, Harry. So Michael says, uh, great presentation. You're so right about how we are doing versus the rest of the world. Is there anything you want to share with us, Harry, about you know, what we're going through with COVID or um, maybe, maybe the social, you know, social justice, racial equity? Yeah. Just all the things we're going through right now. Yeah, sure, sure. Well, there's some couple things I'll share with you folks that I, I've been sharing with, with CEO groups that, that, that may be helpful. Um, this is a difficult time. And, and you guys, men and women that are in leadership positions, uh, one of the key things that I, I would remind you of that I'm sure most of you know is that the importance of, of effective communication and truly communicating with everybody on your team. You know, and obviously you can't do it live all the time. You know, you're doing it on Zoom. But the, the rule of thumb and I may have mentioned this in one of our seminars, uh, Susan, however much importance communication is under normal situations, during the times we're in now, it's three times more important. And the ability to really make sure that you reach out and are communicating constantly. But what a lot of CEOs will say to me, Susan, is, well, uh, I, you know, I, I just don't have all the answers right now. There's just a whole lot of uncertainty. And uh, here's a little tip, Susan, that may be helpful because I, I try to be very practical. Here's the three steps that I usually give to, to senior executives in terms of the best way to communicate during a crisis. Three very simple steps. Step number one, you tell Susan people what you know. Here are the facts. You don't lie to them. You don't make it up. You listen to the experts. Here's what we know, number one. Number two, here's what we don't know, okay? I'm going to be honest. I'm going to be vulnerable. I'm not going to act like I, I, I'm the answer person. But number two, here's what we don't know. And number three, very important, is here's how quickly I'll get back to you with additional information with what I don't know. Here's what I know. Here's what I don't know. Here's how quickly I'll get back to you. And what does that do, Susan? It increases the ability to relate to people, which helps you influence people and helps you lead people, right? Uh, and that constant process becomes important. The other one I'll share that uh, I think has been very helpful to people that I'll just share with you is... I think what you want to do is, is be what uh, is commonly referred to now as being a realistic optimist, okay? So, like I say opinions, and some of you have got opinions. I'd love, I'd love to hear them if, if, they, if they're different here, is we're in the, in the midst now of this pretty serious situation, right? And the reality of life is you keep hearing these comments of this is going to be over quickly. Well, it's going to be over by Easter. It's going to be over by October. We're going to have, uh, you know, a, a vaccine by the end of October. Let me give you the facts, okay? The facts are, this is a serious virus. It is going to take at least another year before we have a vaccine that it's safe enough, that we've got enough millions and hundreds of millions of doses that people are going to be willing to take that's going to impact us. That's just reality, okay? And so dealing with the facts and dealing with what, 
you know, I think Jim Collins at Good to Great calls the brutal facts, I think becomes very important. And here's a little story, Susan, that may put this into perspective that some of you uh, may remember. And this is, I use this, uh, this book in my, in my class, uh, Jim Collins, Good, Good to Great. And some of you uh, may remember this, but he was trying to figure out, Susan, how do senior people deal with a, a disaster, okay, with a crisis? How do they do it? And he was, in an interview, he talked to Admiral Stockdale. And Admiral Stockdale, some of you may remember, he was actually the vice presidential candidate when uh, Ross Perot was running. And, but the important thing about this guy, he was in the, uh, the Hanoi Hilton, the prisoner of war uh, camp, uh, with uh, Senator John McCain. And the question that he asked him, which I thought was fascinating, was, hey, the number of people that died in the camp or they came back to the United States and they, they had mental issues or committed suicide, what, what happened to the people who really didn't make it? And Stockdale said, well, those people, uh, Jim, they were just uh, really overconfident, uh, overly optimistic. And, of course, the reason they call this what I'm describing, Susan, the Stockdale paradox, Collins, well, wait a minute. Uh, well, no, no, it's the people who are optimistic. They, those are the people that would make it. And he said, no, no, it, not the case. And he, the way he explained it was he said, if you're in a prisoner war camp and you tell everybody we're going to be out of here by Easter and then we're not out of there, well, then we're going to be out of there by Christmas and we're not out of there. After a while, you go crazy. And he said, well, what did you guys do? What did you and, Mc, and, and Senator McCain do? He said, well, we basically dealt with the brutal facts. And the brutal facts are we're in a prisoner war camp and we do not know how long this is going to last. But what do we do know? We're Americans. We will get through this. We will get back to our families, but we don't know how long it's going to take. So guess what? We better really save our food. We better keep doing push-ups and exercising. We better keep up because this is going to take a while. We're going to deal with the brutal facts. And I'll tell you, Susan, I get excited about it because that parallels exactly in my mind what we're going through now. Okay? This is a serious deal. Now, why am I an optimist? A a um, a realistic optimist, because if you do your homework and you study it, the, the, the Spanish flu lasted five or six years and killed 35 million people. Now, one person dying is too many, and now we've got a million people as of three days ago that have died. So I'm not making light of that. But this is not the Spanish flu. Okay, we're blessed now with, with enough things that, as we've, we all hear a million times a day, you, you literally keep a mask on, you stay 10 feet apart, and you wash your hands we will figure out a way to get through this. But this idea that everything's going to go back to normal, which, by the way, that's a whole other discussion, Susan. We're not going to go back to normal. There will be a new normal. And how we adjust to that, how we lead with that, how we communicate with that uh, in an open, honest way, in a values-based way, is going to have an enormous impact of our ability to get through this. Harry, for president. Uh, yeah, yeah. There you okay. Go. Here's our last question, Harry. Um, we know that you donate the profits uh, from your book to the One Acre Fund. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about that? And are there any other um, organizations that you support that we should know about? Sure. Oh, well, you, you are wonderful, Susan. So, uh, and Susan uh, may be aware of this. Uh, one of the things, and this goes back, I think it was to Doug's comment about how you make a difference in the world. Uh, and what, what I try to do in my first class uh, for, for the MBA students is I always tell them, let's talk about, Susan, all the issues in the world, global poverty, global health care, digital divide, the environment, uh, climate change, and so on. And I'll say, well, who, who is going to deal with all these issues? And usually, Doug, it turns out that n the names of the people we usually assign to dealing with this is this famous group of people I talk about in my lectures called those guys. I mean, some, some famous group of people somewhere, some men or women somewhere. Uh, and I say, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. We're very blessed. We're very fortunate. Everybody on this call is pretty. We are those. We are the. If we're not the men or women, Doug, who's going to deal with this? Who? Who? Who is? And the best example that I that I love, and I know Susan, you're aware of, is um, one of my students. Literally, uh, was going to work for a bank in New York. He took a trip to Kenya. He came back and he said, "You know what? I, I'm not taking that job in New York." He said, "I'm I'm moving to Kenya." This was, I think, now 11 years ago. And I said, "What are you talking about?" He said, well, Harry, I'm one of those guys. He said, how could it be as I'm visiting Western Kenya and I'm watching the poverty and I'm realizing, Harry, there's a billion people on the earth that you know, are not eating well. And Harry, here's, a, here's one that will really amaze you. Eighty-some percent of the world's uh, impoverished people uh, are farmers. 
And he said, Harry, let's think about this a minute. How does a farmer start? And by the way, this was a history major in college, had no background in agriculture at all. And he said, you know what, Harry, I'm moving to Kenya. And uh, I think if we can get better seeds, better fertilizer, basic irrigation, uh, we can have an enormous impact. And I would encourage uh, uh, everybody in FEI, Susan, just to take a look at two things. There's a website. It, this name of this organization that he started is called the One Acre Fund, O-N-E-A-C-R-E fund.org, okay? And those of you that are into um, TED Talks, the, 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 the student's name is Andrew Yoon, Y-O-U-N, first generation American. Uh, his parents were from South Korea. Uh, and you guys are numbers folks, so let me give you the numbers. He's been there now for 11 years. He started in Kenya. He's in Kenya, Rwanda, Uganda, Tanzania. They've just started in Ethiopia, Susan. They have doubled or tripled the annual crop yield on over 1 million farms that has so far saved the lives of 4 million kids. And when you listen to the TED Talk and you watch the website, um, he's an incredibly humble guy who basically said, we've just started here. We, we've literally just started. He said, Harry, I I'm not coming back. And I've been over there now with, with all my children. And here's what I decided. The first book, uh, you may recall, Susan, uh, was called From Values to Action. And when the first book came out, I called him and said, Andrew, the first book's called From Values to Action. You're the best example I know of From Values to Action. So when I'm not teaching, uh, I'm not running around on these boards, I said once a month, I will do these leadership talks similar to what I'm doing to you guys. And uh, any speaker fee or any of the sales of the books, everything goes to the One Acre Fund. Um, and uh, I said I do one a month. I think this talk for you guys, Susan, is my 1,155th talk uh, in the last now eight years. I do at least two or three of these every week. Um, and I told Don Jacobs uh, before he passed away, he, he said to me, hey, Harry, how are things going? I said, I got to tell you, this is like a trifecta. I said, we get to spread good leadership values. It's great for Kellogg. And we raise a fortune for the One Acre Fund. And as only Don Jacobs could do, he said, Harry, no, it's not a trifecta. It's a fourfecta. I said, what are you talking about? He said, Harry, you love doing this. You'll, you'll do this to your 80. And I said, yeah, I, I, th I think I will. So uh, yeah, you guys should really take a look at it. It's, a, it's an amazing organization. And, and if you buy a bunch of books, uh, all the proceeds go to, uh, go, go to the One Acre Fund. And, and in fact, uh, one of the distributors who's been kind enough uh, that, uh, Susan, if there are people that want to get larger quantities for their teams, we, we can get the books at a significant discount through um, uh, what I think it's called Porchlight. Uh, and I can send that to you. Uh, but it's an amazing story. It goes back to Doug's comment. You know, you either say, well, I'm going to wait for the future. Or you say, wait a minute, what, what am I waiting for? I don't know how much time I've got. H how do I make a difference, you know, now?